Please turn your Bibles over to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. We're going to read a few blocks of Scripture in this lesson. And so if you have trouble staying awake, you might need to stand up every now and then or something. I don't know, to keep that blood going. But uh, we are going to have some blocks of Scripture that we're going to go through uh, just to put everything in context, you might say. But that, of course, is taboo when it comes to preaching. But uh, I feel it's pretty necessary this morning in our study. And so we're going to be dealing with uh, a lot of what's found in Romans chapter 4 here in just a moment. But to kind of set the stage and get us prepared for that and to understand that even Abraham's mind in regard to what was going to happen in the future and how God was going to bring about his plan of salvation, it just didn't make sense. There was still some of what was, uh, well, well, we'll see here in just a moment, that he was still struggling in these early years, you might say, after the promise was given that God would make him a great nation that he still didn't even have a son. He didn't have an heir. And so that's how we're going to begin our lesson this morning. Abraham's response to God's promise. Genesis chapter 15, and we're going to begin reading in verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus, which would seem to be his right-hand man, you might say. There was no one else for him to leave his estate to, uh, in his mind anyways. Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one, referring back to Eliezer, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he delivered in the, or, and he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. So Abraham believes. We're going to see a little bit of, you know, they're, they're going to, we'll see here in just a moment that he's going to improvise. But for Abram, it just doesn't make any sense. Now keep in mind. That we don't really know how old Abraham is at this specific time. We do know that he's over the age of 75. And, you know, if you haven't been able to have children yet, uh, then I think, you know, that folk's already come and gone. But we know that when Abram, Abram is 85 years old, uh, Sarahi is how you would pronounce this, uh, according to the dictionaries, Sarahi's handmaiden was given to him his wife to bring forth a child. Uh, and so when Ishmael is born, Abraham is 86 years old. We would see that here in chapter 16 if you know we were to just go through this narrative. In fact, let's go ahead and look at Genesis chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. Now Sarahi, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarahi said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. You kind of wonder whether she's still kind of giving the blame to Abram, and it's really his fault, right? It's always the man's fault anyway. So, uh, Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. Perhaps, see, I'm not fully convinced that she's thinking it's all her fault, if you will. Something hasn't happened yet. It's already been a decade. So, uh, you know, something ain't jiving here. And so, why don't you go into my handmaiden and, and let's see if we can get that child. And, and in essence, it would be uh, in their day and time, and even today, kind of like a surrogate mother, you might say. And so she would still be, they would count 
the child as Abraham or Abrams and Sarahis. So he went into Hagar and she conceived in verse 4. And when she saw, that is, that Sarahi saw that she, Hagar, had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. And so Hagar was despised by Sarahi. And now she's going to attack Abram. My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. So uh, Hagar despises uh, Sarahi. And so it's a mutual animosity between these two individuals. Now, we know that Hagar runs for her life because Abram's like, do whatever you want to her. And, you know, that's out of my control. And so she treats her harshly. And Hagar finally has enough and she runs off. The Lord tells her to go back. And that out of her, uh, he will uh, bring about some great nations. And so uh, we pick up in chapter 17 and we see that Abram is 99 years old. And God reiterates the, his promise to Abram. And he's confirming this promise. And so we would see in chapter 17 when Abram was 99 years old. So almost 25 years has passed, 24. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. And you shall be father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant, and so on. And so they do have the covenant uh, in this chapter of circumcision, and so on. Of course, uh, as time progresses, uh, you have the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in chapter 19. Uh, the Abimelech, he, Abram, Abraham lies to Abimelech in chapter 20. In chapter 21, you have the birth of Isaac. Uh, and then he's told to go and offer Isaac. And you have a confrontation between Ishmael and Isaac. This is found in chapter 21. So I'm not sure what age Isaac is, but he is being weaned. And the Lord visited Sarah. So now we have Sarah. Uh, believe it or not, it's Sarah. Uh, so we even have a Sarah in our household, uh, our, our, one of our daughters. But it would actually be pronounced S-A-W. You you know you see the, the pronunciations. And then R-A-H, uh, Ra. So saw, like you saw something. Raw, so Sarah, but we say Sarah. But that's just a little footnote. Okay, and the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord said to Sarah, for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. So he fulfilled the promise. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him whom Sarah bore to him Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh so that all who hear will laugh with me. Uh, so uh, when she reaches this, this uh, set age, we see in verse 7 and in verse 9, so the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, scoffing. So making fun of him, laughing at him, ridiculing him, teasing him, something along those lines. Uh, making fun of him. And then we see in verse 10, Therefore she said to Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman. That's where we're really going to
focus our attention. So cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. Now, you know, Abraham's not pleased with this because uh, Ishmael is still his son, but uh, she is sent away, and we, uh, that's how we end up with all those Middle Easterners that are not Jews, uh, the Arabs, uh, Iraqians, and so on and so forth, those all come from Ishmael. And that's why we still have the, that, that conflict between Israel and all these other Middle East countries, is that they think that they're the heirs of the promise, if you will. Uh, they are descendants of Abraham, not Sarah. And so we have this uh, distinction made between the two. The bondwoman and the free woman. And so, having said that, let's turn over to Galatians chapter 4. And there's going to be an explanation given by Paul in regard to Hagar and Sarah. Galatians chapter 4, we're going to begin reading in verse 21, and we're going to finish out the chapter. So he's doing some reasoning here in regard to the law and grace, if you will. Um, the bondwoman and the free woman. And this has many applications. We won't deal with all of them in this lesson. But Galatians chapter 4, verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? So here's the issue. Remember, in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6, Paul has said, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him, from Christ, who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. What they're trying to do is go back to the old law, and they're saying you have to be circumcised to be a child of God. That's what the Jews are insisting of the Gentiles. And of course, we could go over to Acts chapter 15 and see that the conclusion is drawn that you do not have to be circumcised to be a child of God, to be a Christian, that is. And so, Paul's going to make this comparison between Hagar and Sarah, the bondwoman and the free woman. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, and one by the bondwoman, that'd be Ishmael, and the other by the free woman, Isaac. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. Whose plan was it? Actually, it was Sarahi's. Sarahi says, you know, it's taking a little long for God to fulfill this. There must be something wrong with you. I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a conclusion, and maybe that wasn't the case at all. And so it's kind of like, okay, let's go. I'm going to go ahead and give you my maiden, and uh, if you can bear children, then we'll just call that ours. And I'm thinking that she's thinking that, no, it's all Abraham's fault. He can't bear children. It's not me. It's him. And then what happens? We got a child. Uh-oh. Uh, it's not Abraham. It's me. But they're thinking only of the flesh, not spiritual and literally a miracle being performed by God himself. That they would bear these children, or bear this child, excuse me, in their old age. Because time is of the essence. He's already 75. She's 65. It's not going to get any better as time prolongs. But that's exactly God's point. Because God is doing this. And so in this circumstance, the bondwoman, being Hagar, is of the flesh. This was man's devising, not God's. And so that's exactly what Paul is pointing out here. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, verse 23, and he of the free woman through promise. 
which things are symbolic. So here's the application. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. Paul is saying that the bondwoman represents the law that was given from Mount Sinai. You remember when it thundered and it shook and everything and they're just scared to death and uh, requested that God never speak to them again. And so he says, that's good. I'll speak through Moses and so on. And there's going to be a prophet. Remember that's going to come later. A prophet like me, Moses says. And of course we know that that's Jesus. So here they took matters in their own hands. It's fleshly. It's carnal. It's, it's of man. It is not of God. And the correlation that's not exact because we know that God gave the old law is one that would be more of fleshly than spiritual. It was going to uh, also be a bondage, controlling in comparison to the New Covenant, the New Testament, the law of Christ. And so we see that as he walks through this, it's symbolic, the two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, birth to bondage, which is Hagar. Hagar, Mount Sinai, and Arabia corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is these Jews who are wanting to hang on to the old law. He's saying, it's not doing you any good. Notice, for it is written in verse 27, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear, break forth and shout, you who do not travail. Those who aren't going to labor uh, to bear children, you should rejoice, be glad. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now, I think that what it's being expressed here is that, in essence, Hagar marries, in a sense, of becoming one with her, um, having uh, been together to bear this child. She is not desolate. She's got a husband, but the one who's desolate is Sarah. She's desolate, but she's going to end up with a whole lot more children than the one who is young and able to bear children. So in verse 28, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. We are the ones that should be of Isaac, this children, the children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him, that is Ishmael persecuted Isaac who was born according to the spirit not the flesh, but the spirit, because it's a miracle by God, even so it is now. So Paul is saying, look, you're being burdened. You're being teased and mocked and ridiculed because you haven't been circumcised. And Paul is saying, you don't have to be circumcised. That has nothing to do. In fact, if you go back to a part of the law, you have to keep the whole thing. And it is the law of sin and death. It couldn't take away sin. So many other ramifications. So in verse 30, nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. That's exactly what we read that Sarah said. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free and so, Hagar and Sarah, one is the bondwoman, one is the free woman, one is the flesh, and one is of promise. The two covenants is Mount Sinai, which is bondage. Hagar is represented even Jerusalem in the first century when the new kingdom had already been established, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Jerusalem represented this old law, this law of bondage. It represented Hagar. You see, there's nothing special about Jerusalem anymore. 
The, the premillennialists that talk about Christ coming back and sitting upon the throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years and reigning and bringing all these people to him, it's a bunch of hogwash. It's not true. There's nothing special about Jerusalem anymore. Because we are not children of the bondwoman of Hagar. We are children of the promise. Children of Sarah. We are free. Versus the Jerusalem above. And that is referring to that sense of our names are written in the book of life. We're children of God. And it's, it's every nation. It's not limited to one nation. Circumcision was only for the Jew, the descendants of Abraham. So few children in regard to Mount Sinai, in regard to Hagar. In comparison, you think about how many people have been born over in the Middle East. The Iraqians and uh, Afghanistans and so on and so forth. In comparison to all those who have been made Christians since the time of Christ. Which one is more? Is it not the fulfillment of God that you couldn't count the stars? You can't count the sand on the seashore. And that's exactly who we are. And so it versus the desolate, that is Sarah, who would seem to be impossible for her to ever give birth. And that's the whole point. Has become the children who had um, the husband. So Ishmael and Isaac. We are like Isaac, children of promise, born of spirit. Ishmael persecuted Isaac, and so it is today that Jews will persecute Christians, but they certainly did back in those days. There were people who sought Saul of Tarsus uh, to kill him. And so the scripture says, Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. We are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free and so that carries us into our third point, that we are heirs of Abraham. So turn over to Romans chapter 4. I told you that we were going to spend some time in Romans chapter 4. We're, we're going to walk through this context and make a few comments along the way, but I promise that we won't be here all day. Romans chapter 4 and verse 1. What shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works... He has something of which to boast, but not before God. The idea that I did it, you let me into heaven. I can do whatever I want because you can't stop me. I earned it. No, of course, we know that that's not the case. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something of which to boast, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are, count, are not counted as grace, but as a debt. And so you finish your work week uh, when I was a machinist and uh, everyone, literally everyone in the shop stood in line on Friday at the end of the day and took their step forward day, I mean step by step as the boss would literally look through the, the envelopes and hand each one of us our paycheck. By grace? No, I earned it. I worked for that paycheck. Now, the argument that Paul is making here is that we can't have that mindset. We can't have that fleshly, carnal mindset that I can work myself into heaven. Work in that sense, for my salvation, to earn it, to demand of God that paycheck. Because if I got up there and he didn't have my envelope with the name on, with my name on it, after I've done my 40 hours, I'm gonna, we're gonna have some, we're gonna have a little talk, right? Because I deserve what I get, but not when it comes to God. So the argument that Paul is making is that it was by promise, not by the works of Abraham. We would see verses 9 through 12 that it wasn't because circumcision. So prior to his circumcision, it was accounted to him for righteousness. We see that in verse 9. For I say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. We would also see in verses 13 through 15 for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, the giving of law, but through righteousness, through the righteousness of faith. 
For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect, because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. So therefore, it is a faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Because I don't know, I'm looking out over this crowd, I'm pretty sure ain't not one of you a Jew. And if you ain't a Jew, guess what? You can't be of the law. Not in its truest sense. To be a physical, kind of the Hagar type, the, the literal blood relative of Abraham. And so it's not by the law. It's not by circumcision. It's not by works that we can earn our salvation. It's by faith. Now, I didn't say faith alone, but it's by faith so that we can be children of promise. So our justification is through Jesus. Faith and grace. And we see that uh, beginning in Romans chapter 4 and verse 11. But if you'll notice... We drop down to verse 17. We read verse 16 just a moment ago. That Abraham, who is the father of us all, because we're children of faith and believing in the promise of God, just as Abraham did. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, even God who gives life to the dead and calls those Things which do not exist as though they did. Who contrary to hope and hope believed so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken so shall your descendants be. He even argued, remember it's how we began the lesson. He even argued with God. How can I have an heir if I have no children? But just, just we, we didn't read all of it. He's almost pleading with God just make Ish, uh, Ishmael make um, Eliezer, my heir. And God says, no. No, one born of you. And so, it was going to be this promise. And even though the law comes along, in between the promise made to Abraham and us, it doesn't change things. So, we would see that over in Romans chapter 8. Uh, there's, there's much spoken as far as uh, chapter 7 that um, the Jews were married to uh, a husband, married to the law, if you will. The law dies so that they can be released from that bondage of being married to that husband, to be married to another, of course, which is Christ. And then in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. So we see this contrast also included here in this context of Romans chapter 8 of that idea we don't we want to follow the bondwoman we will follow Hagar or do we want to follow Sarah the the woman of promise. And so jumping down to verse 12 therefore brethren we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Do you want to be the children of bondage? Or the children of the free woman? In Romans... Here, we've been set free from the bondage of sin. We're no longer slaves of sin in Romans chapter 6. And so, which are we going to be led by? In verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. And that's what really uh, is the catalyst for this lesson is we talked about being adopted. And so the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and if children then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ if indeed we suffer with him that we may be glorified together. And that's, that's our hope in God. 
We're completely reliant upon His grace, His mercy, His love. We, we are completely dependent upon it. We believe no less than Abraham believed that God was going to eventually give him an heir that you and I are going to receive an inheritance. And that is to put off this flesh someday and to be resurrected unto life. Going back to Galatians, in Galatians chapter 3, and we'll come to a, a close. You say, well, why was the law given then? Well, those questions are asked here in this chapter. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 19, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgression. Till the seed, and he's already established that that uh, is uh, Jesus Christ. The seed, seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of the mediator. Now, a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promise of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But guess what? There is no law that gives life. But the scripture has con confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Do you believe? But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized, have you been baptized? For as many of you as were baptized, baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So what happened millenniums ago still applies to us today. Do you want to be a slave to sin? Or do you want to be free in Christ? Heirs of the promise that God would bless. That God would give. That God would wash away their sins, remembering them no more. That we'd be bound by love rather than a law that's restrictive, that only points out sin. Don't you want to be in grace, in the grace of God? If you believe and you're baptized, then you will be saved. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that He was resurrected from the dead after He was put to death, that your sins might be washed away? If you believe that, then we would implore you to respond. Become a child of Sarah rather than Hagar. To no longer be bound, but to be released. And to anticipate the inheritance given only to those who were counted as the, the seed of Abraham. We can help you in that regard. Won't you come as we say?